the best way for me is to go to a work of art naked and open. It's not that I actually visit museums without my clothes. I can assure you I don't. But I mean naked in terms of uh, expectation to the degree that it's possible. I think that um, expectation is inevitably part of, of, of perception. And often we can be blinded by those expectations. For example, the expectation of greatness. Greatness is one of the sorry things that really interferes with our, I think, our pleasure in art. So, uh, so works can become so great with quotations around them that they actually disturb perception. Something like the Mona Lisa has uh, almost lo lost its capacity to be seen. That's, this is sad, but I, I think it's also true. So as open as possible, and then despite the fact that a painting is there all at once, it seems to me we have to give the painting or the work of art time. So no one can really look at a work of art quickly. And if you can understand a work of art within about five seconds, then it's not worth looking at to begin with. So you might as well just let it go. I call those works one-liners. <laughs> you know, if it's a joke, fine, you can leave it alone. If you think you've understood everything, of course, sometimes there are levels of play in, in an image so that you can see something very quickly. And then if you move away from the image, you're losing all the the, all that that will come later to you. But no, time is, is important in the sense that a painting can only unfold for the viewer in time, or any work of art, a sculpture, you have to move around. Uh, and I don't see, some, I, sometimes I see people uh, looking for a long time. And then um, I know that there's a kind of independent vision at work. Um, the quick tour through a gallery or a museum is just not going to help. I remember um, when I was very young, having a fascination, fasc fascination with Botticelli, for example, which then I became less interested. I got much more interested in, in work that I considered tough and unsentimental and not so pretty. But then there was a certain moment where I began to look at Botticelli again and found another kind of interest um, in that work. So I think we, we, we can return uh, to earlier things. Of course, I grew up in... Um, a Norwegian-American house household. My mother is Norwegian. My father taught um, Norwegian language and literature. So Edvard Munch was everywhere. And one resists this a little bit. I was, as a small girl, fascinated, even made drawings that were, you know, my poor copies of, of Munch paintings. But then I, I resisted it. <laughs> you know, and again, this kind of... <clears throat> expressionism and the, the big emotion. But no, I'm completely in Munch's thrall um, as an older person, so I've made another circle. Uh, no, I think that uh, looking at art is always an intersubjective experience. And when I say that, I mean that looking at art is, no matter how beautiful a table is, it's different. And that the traces of a living consciousness remain a force in any work of art, so that the experience you're having is not identical to that of a living person who uh, can speak back to you, but that it is nevertheless intersubjective, that we treat works of art more like people than we treat a spoon. And that's correct. It's funny to say that, but I think that's really right. So that even with the same work of art, we are not, until we're dead, you know, we're always changing, we're always becoming. 
and uh, the return to works of art that maybe you thought you understood earlier. I find that I'm always returning to something that's a little bit changed. Either because I failed to notice something or because I wasn't in a position to be able to notice it. The word is always an abstraction uh, in a way that looking at an image is not. I mean, th there, there are differences. People who try to turn, who try to make the experience of the image the same as the experience of the text are simply wrong. I mean, just it's not the same. Um, and so the, the particular spoon is not the same as the spoon, 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 right? So if you're writing about, say, a spoon that has a little dent, you have to include that. And even though someone looking at the spoon would see instantly, perhaps, that there's a spoon with a dent, and it would be part of the immediate grasping of the image. In text, you have to add that detail serially. You know, it becomes a sequential um, description. So they are very different. But I think for me, the act of not pretending that I can translate the image into text, but that I can make an attempt to translate my experience of looking at an image into an essay is wonderful. It also helps me work out my own visual experience. Uh, and I love doing it. I, and even in my fiction, I am continually returning to characters who make visual art, and it's only described in words. And of course, I have understood that readers create different images for those same descriptions. Uh, there was a, a group of artists in Germany who made artworks from the descriptions in my novel, What I Loved. And of course, they didn't look anything like my own visual fantasies of, of uh, what Bill William Wexler's look, work actually looked like in my mind. But it doesn't matter, of course, because there's um, inside the reader, the work lives in different ways. And even when there's an actual work of art, not a textual work of art, uh, I wrote in one essay in an earlier uh, book of essays only about painting, every painting is always two paintings, the one you see and the one you remember. So you carry, we, you know, the work of art we carry around with us is a memory, not the original, as it were. I think that people have different levels of sensitivity uh, to looking at things. And uh, there are times when I uh, become overstimulated, uh, overcooked, really, that the experience becomes more than I can bear. And I close my eyes. I turn away and uh, build myself up until I can look again. And I think powerful works of art should actually uh, affect us in this way. You shouldn't be able, or maybe this is my prejudice, but, but I feel if I can walk through enti an entire room of art and not feel like closing my eyes, I haven't seen very much. Or I haven't seen anything that, um, that will alter me. And I think when I look at works of art, I'm always looking for something that will change me. And Goya is, is, is definitely one of them. I mean, there was a moment, I've written three essays on Goya. And this is an artist that I could probably just spend the rest of my life thinking about him. In the real world, we look to people gather to watch fires burning, ogle, beheadings on the internet, just as they used to rush to public hangings. 
On 9-11, my sister ran north with her seven-year-old daughter and hundreds of others away from the burning towers behind them. And just before she reached their street, she said to my niece, OK, now turn around and look. They did. I don't know why, my sister told me. I just did it. My sister also remembers running past a man who had kneeled in the street to vomit, like Goya's man in the disasters who spews over a pile of corpses. His body rejected the horror he had seen. Goya may well have been the first modern artist, but his images will outlive the modern and the postmodern and whatever comes after it because instinctual fear and fury aren't characteristic of any particular age, nor are violence, loss, grief, madness, and dreams. Context, vocabulary, ideology, and technologies all shift with time and surely play an important role in shaping our collective consciousness. But the Goya that continues to sustain art in its myriad forms is a person who felt the anarchic, unspeakable depths we carry within us and was able to make us recognize them. We find ourselves looking in a mirror. In Goya, we are the monsters. The artists that I really love are artists where there's some excess or superflex. It's the thing that I can't get that I'm interested in. I'm never interested in what I can easily understand or even master, you know, with some effort. I'm interested in art, whether it's, you know, music or painting or literature, where I can't completely get it. I think that the best accumulation of knowledge is born out of genuine curiosity. So on the very few occasions that I found myself in a classroom talking to students, I always say, you know, follow your own nose. Hmm? One text will lead you to the next. One image will lead you to the next image. Um, a painting may lead you to a book. But, uh, you know, follow your own passionate curiosity. Um, don't allow yourself to be told what to think or what's good or what's great with a capital G. This can only mislead you. You know, I think people have to learn from the inside out, not the outside in.